Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. John, it's your turn. Tell us what you picked. I picked a story by John Gardner called Redemption. One day in April, a clear blue day when there were crocuses in bloom, Jack Hawthorne ran over and killed his brother David. Even at the last moment, he could have prevented his brother's death by slamming on the tractor brakes, easily in reach for all the shortness of his legs, but he was unable to think, or rather, thought unclearly, and so watched it happen, as he would again and again watch it happen in his mind with nearly undiminished intensity and clarity all his life. The younger brother was riding, as both of them knew he should not have been, on the cultipacker, a two-ton implement lumbering behind the tractor, crushing new plowed ground. Jack was twelve, his brother David seven. The scream came not from David, who never got a sound out, but from their five-year-old sister, who was riding on the fender of the tractor. Looking back, when Jack turned to look, the huge iron wheels had reached his brother's pelvis. He kept driving, reacting as he would to a half-crushed farm animal, and imagining, in the same stab of thought, that perhaps his brother would survive. Blood poured from David's mouth. Their father was nearly destroyed by it. Sometimes Jack would find him lying on the cow barn floor, crying, unable to stand up. Dale Hawthorne, the father, was a sensitive, intelligent man, by nature a dreamer. It showed in old photographs, his smile coated, his eyes on the horizon. He loved all his children and would not consciously have been able to hate his son, even if Jack had indeed been, as he thought himself, his brother's murderer. But he could not help sometimes seeming to blame his son, though consciously he blamed only his own unwisdom and, so far as his belief held firm, God. Dale Hawthorne's mind swung violently at this time, reversing itself almost hour by hour, from desperate faith to the most savage black-hearted atheism. Every sickly calf, every sow that ate her litter, was a new, sure proof that the religion he'd followed all his life was a lie. Yet skeletons were orderly, as were, he thought, the stars. He was unable to decide, one moment full of rage at God's injustice, the next moment racked by doubt of his existence. Though he was not ordinarily a man who smoked, he would sometimes sit up all night now, or move restlessly, hurriedly, from room to room, chain-smoking lucky strikes. Or he would ride away on his huge, darkly thundering Harley Davidson 80, trying to forget, morbidly dwelling on what he'd meant to put behind him. How David had once laughed, cake in his fists. How he'd once patched a chair with precocious skill. Or Dale Hawthorne would think, for the hundredth time, about suicide. Hunting in mixed fear and anger for some reason not to miss the next turn, fly off to the right of the next iron bridge onto the moonlit gray rocks, and the black water below, discovering, invariably, no reason but the damage suicide would do to his wife and the children remaining. Had you read this story before? I had not read this story before. I knew of its existence because I've read tons of John Gardner stuff. Yeah. And uh, apparently it's uh, semi-autobiographical. I'm not sure how much. I know the the incident where he his brother was killed is true. Uh, I don't know any of the rest, how far the truth extends into it. So I've been, you know, it's been in the background for a long time. I've been wanting to read it, but never did for whatever reason. It's super sad. Yeah. Yeah, it is. They cover like, if not like a lot of time, they cover, he covers like a lot of um, kind of stages of this grief. I think like the only thing I saw for time was like a year and a half after the accident it talked about. Yeah, something like that. Because that beginning part talks about how he thinks about it like every day for his entire life or whatever. But we don't really see him like, we don't see the brother as an adult, even though that that mention of thinking a bit of it his whole life makes you makes it seem like maybe this story would kind of like fly through all that but really he's like a kid the whole time but we get to see him like in the immediate aftermath and like shortly after and then we get to see like uh his dad kind of abandon the family there briefly and then come back and like how he's changed and then that last like fifth of the story is kind of seems like unrelated where the main character here jack is uh taking like music lessons and that's kind of where it ends, but it's like a different like iteration of his grief, you know? Yeah, it's like the last four pages introduced this uh, French horn teacher. And I wrote my next to it was like late introduction. Right. It's like what's such happening? a really important character yeah. for how it spools out, but introduced right at the 12th, at the 11th hour, you know, like we're approaching the end of the story. Here's a character. <laughs> I mean, as with all the other characters, really fully drawn, we get a sense of him as a character very uh, easily and quickly 
and he's impactful and it doesn't feel like he's out of place or anything. It's just like, you know, you're often told as a writer to like set your seeds in the beginning so they can sprout at the end. Right. Although the French horn thing is introduced earlier. So like a French horn teacher makes sense. Yeah, but you're right. When I started reading that section, I was like, oh, okay. I don't know where this is going. (laughs) That's right. Like it felt like we were starting like a new, not a new story, but like a new direction kind of. I was like, so maybe this isn't a story about (laughs) this plaguing him his entire life. Maybe we're getting away from that. Maybe this is where like music heals him, (laughs) but that is not the case. No, not really. This has nothing to do with anything, but I played the French horn. So when I read that, I was like, oh, cool. I wasn't very good or anything. But um, like, it's cool. And this happens rarely for me. That's just maybe why I have to point it out <laughs> that like, I'll read a story and you can tell that like, maybe someone, maybe either John Gardner or someone actually played French horn, you know, because the way like some of that's described, like the way that you would like stick your hand in the bell and like fiddle with the three keys before you start. When we talk about write what you know, and then you actually see it in practice and you can confirm some of that. That it's like wow yeah this guy doesn't always talking yeah. about we just kind of assume it in other situations like when you read the word call the packer <laughs> we're like yeah. they must know what those do <laughs> that's right it's so minor in the story but i played french horn i could have i could include it in a story and people would be like wow what a writer yeah you can tell that he's seen someone with a french horn or yeah. held one himself or he's aware he knows what it looks like it feels like to be around a french horn yeah i think you know you know as a writer you can do that even if you don't have the personal experience as long as you like do some research, figure it out. And it depends on the point of view, but in third person, if you go to a concert and watch, just like watch third yeah. chair violinist for like the whole thing and just like watch all their mannerisms and stuff then in a story it'll feel real right because on some level it is it is real exactly yeah <laughs> as long as you have a good eye for that kind of detail yeah i could continue this tangent forever but that's kind of like that used to be the fun part of journalism was like you know i'm not an expert at this thing but i do think if i watch it for a second or if i like absorb a little bit of it then i can like write a sentence or two that like not just proves that i was there but we always called it like adding color to a story Story. And it's so fun in just those brief moments when, and it was always like a story that I didn't want to do or a story of like little significance, like go to a, a kid's concert. And maybe, maybe the cool part of it for me where I got my rocks off would be the, like describing how that like first chair violinist like played. And it's cool because you're like, if anyone was there and even if they weren't, they could read that sentence and, and know that I was there. So that, it's always just fun to like write that kind of stuff. One thing I noticed, like, you know, we're talking about a very specific moment about the French horn but I think you know he does it throughout he's building all these characters and really um, kind of like summarizing character sketchy kind of ways but the details that he's honing in on aren't like what he looks like entirely I mean you know he mentions that but the really characterizing details are the actions they take right yeah. so the actions you take in order to play a French horn putting your hand in the bellows fiddling with the keys that's the the human action that defines your interaction with the French horn that kind of sells us as like like it being realistic and feeling like you're in the in the moment in the same way with a character like um when he's describing she he describes his mother as crying she cried now like she didn't cry before but she cried now nights and did only as much as she had strength to do so sapped by grief that she could barely move her arms uh she comforted jack and his sister phoebe herself as well by embracing them vehemently whenever new waves of guilt swept in by constant reassurance and extravagant praise frequent mention of how proud some relative would be, etc. Those are like specific actions that she is doing again and again in her way of handling this grief or not handling the grief. So anyway, this uh, concept of using specific actions. I think a lot of um, workshop stories we get will have a lot of concrete description, like uh, the color, the light quality, but the actions is where the fiction's at, I think. Maybe this is not as good an example now that I heard you explain that whole thing. But when you first started talking about like how he's not just doing it with the French horn, I thought too of how they describe the father reciting his poetry that's something too because that's like that's not the kind of thing like what does grief look like in the abstract that's a right. concrete specific thing that this character like gave up he was doing poetry and then he didn't do poetry right and then when he when he gets back to it he's like he's like a shell of himself in terms of being the performer yeah exactly 
some really great character building in this piece. Yeah, like I said, that was like what first struck me when I finished reading it. I was like, okay, so we didn't cover a ton of time, but we covered like a bunch of uh, variations of these characters. And I mean, Jack's still our main character because even for all the time we spend talking about his dad, it's really so that we know how he feels in response to how his dad handled it, you know? And even the sister, um, she's got a brief section in there. That was my favorite part. She brings him lunch one day in one particular scene they talk about how she brings lunch down from the house while he's working in the field and and that one day like when she brings it uh she's like do you want to say grace and he's like no No, and then he like kind of quickly recovers and realizes like this is somehow important to her and he says no yeah i did and then later he like articulates in a way that i think we all kind of know what that meant for her but it was so well written afterwards where he said like jack realized that if he didn't say grace right then and if she didn't think that like he believed in that kind of thing then all the implications of god not being real or (laughs) meant that like their brother was dead and meant that like all these other horrible things were true the the moment it's like uh do you want to say grace not really he said and glanced at her he saw that she was looking at his face in alarm her mouth slightly opened eyes wide growing wider and though he didn't know why his heart gave a jump i already said it he mumbled just not out loud oh she said and smiled so in that paragraph he doesn't know why but i think when i was reading that i could guess why you know yeah exactly like, she's looking for something to hold on to and he's like saying there's nothing there and then it was a few paragraphs later it's like not till he was doing the chores that night did he grasp what her look of alarm had meant right if he wouldn't say grace then perhaps there was no heaven their father would never get well and david was dead I was wondering when I read that if it was necessary. And I think it's, it is, I think it works and yeah. you, you want it there as part of, cause it's the character coming to that conclusion. It's yeah. that you as, you're not you as a reader right. coming to that right. conclusion. Cause he has to recite that in his head. He has to live through that thought process. It's not just telling us about it. <laughs> yeah. Because he like, he acts correctly in the moment, but like that section says, like he has to think all day about why it occurred to him to want to lie to her in the first place. You know, he's like, what was, yeah. oh, because this is really important to her. Yeah, I totally exactly. get that. I love that part because I love, uh, you know, anytime there's like a character that's grappling with like, is religion real? Because <laughs> not religion, religion's very real. <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Every time I read something like that, I'm like, yeah, wow. Like, this sounds like a character that has grappled with, is my religion uh, really going to save me? Is God real? I don't know. It's as real for me as like the French horn, but... I want to talk about the ending. Is that okay? Yeah, I feel like I always want to talk about the ending. But like we mentioned, the last maybe fifth of this story is the sudden introduction and time spent on the French horn teacher. And you don't really know where it's going. Like, why why are we going to dedicate this much time to this guy, you know? But it kind of ends here on this note of Jack, like asking the teacher, the teacher takes the horn and I think it's like a newer horn or whatever. He like sticks a new mouthpiece in it and he like messes around with it before it's Jack turn to do whatever and that's the description we talked about at the beginning where it's like okay you can tell this guy's been around a french horn a couple times right because it's like beautifully described and whether or not you actually know what's happening (laughs) um you could tell this writer does so there's this like moment where jack completely innocently like no presumption at all he's like wow like do you think i'll ever play like that and his teacher about loses his shit and they describe like the look in his eyes like it's like incredulous but it's like maniacal too or something i forget the word and jack is like realizing in the moment what a stupid question he's asked because he's in the presence of greatness you know and he knows it he's not diminishing it by asking will i be like that but that's why the teacher for the first time like doesn't end up complaining that lesson about how he hates the world and everyone in it he's a little softer for a moment he's a little softer briefly but almost only after he like loses his shit you know he's like do you think you'll ever be this it wasn't even he wasn't even mean or anything it was just no he's just like, like what are you talking he's like play like as me? if that's the point yeah back blinked startled by the bluntness of the thing the terrible lack of malice terrible i love that phrase terrible lack of malice and the truth of it you know he's just like he's not being mean with it he's just he's shocked he's like what you thought that was a possibility really yeah which is funny because i think he probably realized like he like comes to his senses and is like kinder the rest of the lesson because like why else would you be going to a french horn lesson if some part of you didn't think that maybe you could be great you know but for jack it's like he ends up walking away from this lesson he's crying and you know we get the sense that this is like a metaphor for like how good how much better can this get for me if i'm already 
already thinking about my brother's death and killing him on a daily basis. And then I got this teacher telling me that like, this no, it's never, you're never going to be the greatest. It's like, oh, am I ever going to be free of this grief? Am I ever going to like feel better than I do right now? Like, is it all kind of like hopeless? Is it all um, delusional somehow to think that it gets much wildly different than it is? That's what I kind of took from it. One thing that that moment has built up into it is the teacher's background, like where he came yes. from as this yeah. insane survivor of like, difficulty, difficult, like his whole village is massacred. And he's like one of the lone survivors. His wife is like, what was uh, the description? She's like not maimed in some way, but she's like really battered and like never heals right. I said difficulty because it's like, how else do you equate what he went through and what Jack's going through? I oh, mean, like, oh yeah, yeah. Trauma. Both, like they, they both have that trauma, right? Yeah. Some kind of background that, yeah. How do you recover from that? Yeah. They're obviously each personal and overwhelming, probably in certain ways, even though they're different. But it seems like his, do you connect that trauma with his French horn playing? Right. Does that inform Jack's response? Like, can Jack make that connection too? Oh, sure. Like, does that give it a little bit of hope, right? A little bit of like, you find something. That you you can can become good at. Yeah. I mean, the story is called redemption, right? So it's a way to find a way to. Yeah. So that's a good point too, that uh, like as Jack's leaving, and kind of like crying about this that maybe the other part that he's thinking about is like uh, can I like you said have some kind of redemption in music like this guy did yeah and maybe the guy is less telling him like no you can't hope to be a good player so much as like you can't overcome this difficulty I think it's more you can't play like me yeah you have your own problems yeah I didn't look up anything because I don't I don't want to know I mean I don't want to know for this conversation I might look it up later but John Gardner I'm pretty sure had some kind of musical something. He played an instrument. Maybe he was in like a little band that played once in a while or something, or just got together with friends or something. I'm pretty sure he did that. And I I was just wondering when I got to the end of it, if he played the French horn, because like I said at the beginning, I know that the inciting incident is true. I do not know how much the rest of it is. Is the ending true as well? Is it something that he went through learning the French horn and kind of devoting himself to that as a way to get through? I don't think it matters for the construction of the story it's just it's just a question it's just a wondering yeah because if it is true it's just neat when stories are done well like that you know yeah well, I guess one thing to say, if it were true, if it is true, then, you know, he's he's really good at finding within his own life the arc of a story, right? Yeah. A lot of people look for stories in their own lives and they find an interesting incident, but they don't find an arc. Right. Which in this case, if we were going to apply that, the interesting story would be the accident and the arc would be something that you have to be a little more skilled to make the connection to this music lesson, right? Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Like he titled it Redemption. So at some point, in his process, he figured out what that arc was. He knows that it's not just the in, the incident that started it all. It's figuring it out. It's right. finding out something about it. We've talked a little bit, maybe at least in our workshop, maybe I don't know how much on the podcast about, you know, people that want to write autobiographical shit. And it's like, nobody cares. And the reason why nobody cares is because we all have what feels like important and interesting stories about ourselves, but that's all they are. It's like these little snippets. Yeah. There's no arc the premise of like your brother dying in an accident is good enough but like the delivery is what like we would be reading for and and he manages to do that here because like you said he's somehow at some point drawing this kind of conclusion for himself not a conclusion but like a parallel you know he's he's relating these events which i think that's a good takeaway if you want to write something about yourself you know if there's like something like really important in your life if you can as a takeaway connect whatever minimal or massive trauma in your life to like something else that like actually has happened and like draw the parallels that's where you get like the really strong writing you know because it had this just ended like oh and his father came home and he did poetry again but like it wasn't as good or you know jack realized that religion even though he didn't believe in it was important for his sister like that's not as cool as like this other thing where there's something like poetic about the comparison but also really telling about the fact that like he can't even go to a music lesson without thinking about this you know it all, it all relates back one of my potential takeaways when i was first thinking about this story was going to be about you as a writer using writing to deal with your trauma to figure yeah. out oh yeah and i think we all just do that you know just like it's because it's, it's what's on your mind it's like where do your stories come from it's like from my trauma <laughs> but like actually 
finding out that the trauma itself could be an, the inciting incident, but then resolving it, finding that arc, finding out yeah. like where it goes is how you find a story out of it. Right. Like you were saying, it's not just the trauma itself. It's got to, you got to do no, something with it. Right. Like you kind of said, like the trauma could, I forget how you worded it at first, but the reason I only thought of that is because like the trauma is like the inciting incident. It's not the story. It's almost like the premise, but the story is not that it happened. Like nobody fucking cares if it happened. Everybody has something horrible that happens to them. Yeah. But yeah, that's my takeaway is to kind of like come up with a couple things that you've actually gone through and see what you can do. I was going to say, I wrote that story about the swimming and um, I'd taken all those little incidents that were true to my life. But I was like, it's not a story. I need a character. I need a character with a problem. And like, so I just kind of had to invent a character that would have done the things that I was trying to describe for the reason of a problem and then figure out how that would resolve. And that's where that story comes from. So it's all like based on true events but it's all invented because it's not me it's a different character yeah i think that's um not only a kosher for writing but also just like a really good exercise yeah like part of this is from a true thing that happened to me and the rest of it is me almost like pontificating yeah my takeaway probably probably would have landed on that as a takeaway that using writing to figure out your your own life or just pulling things from your life to make to infuse your writing which is like you know what we do it's, it's what we do anyway Way. The other option I had was something about characterization, like building characters, because he does so many characters in here in such mm-hmm. detail and such completeness. And it's not just like, a, here's a snapshot of the character. It's like a developing character. Like too. the music. Like, and the father, the father changes like dramatically. Right. Even the sister. Yeah. Even the sister has a little bit of a, if not an arc, like she changes. Yeah. She goes from little sister to like staunch defender to struggling with religion. Yeah. Because that's those are all counterpointed against Jack, who is kind of stuck. Yeah, he's super stuck. He goes out by himself, and he hasn't, he can't get past it. Anyway, you know, we talked about characters and actions and stuff, so I think that is another potential takeaway for this podcast. It's a choose your own takeaway. <laughs> yeah, choose your own takeaway. Let us know, listeners, what did you learn from this story? <laughs> Send us an email. <laughs> what did you learn about cult of Packers? What did you learn about the safe usage of cult packers? There you go. Don't sit on the hitch. <laughs> that would literally be a question in like an English textbook. Oh my God. What a horrifying question. Yeah. It's like, oh, here, relive the trauma in your answer. All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.